Hi, good afternoon. And I was really hoping this room was going to half after he left, but that didn't happen. So I'm going to disappoint you all. I'm not a great public speaker. I don't really like being in public, but um, I have a couple of things that I think are interesting to talk about today. And a very, very different talk from the one that you heard before. So I'm slightly even more apprehensive, but we'll see. Um, first and foremost, um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about me as we go along, but first and foremost, uh, this. I uh, sourced this in the morning. I think it's um, really important that we establish this for anyone in the room that's in that profession. Um, and the reason I sourced this is because I want you guys to kind of like me and connect emotionally with me. That's really important. That's my brand and it's really um, useful. It's useful for everyone. Um, and that's kind of a lesson that all brands in the world know very well. Um, and these guys, all of the brands that you can read over there, um, are really, really good at getting us to like them. So let's start first. So we don't have a lot of time, and I have no clue how long my talk is. I think it, it, it used to be around 40 minutes. I can be really quick, but probably not, not a good idea. So I'll just try and plow through it. Um, don't anyone try and stop me. So let's see what happens. First and foremost, this, there's a little video I want you guys to um, look at. Let's see if this works. Never know with technology. I couldn't make a web film for that much. Al-Qaeda's been on the cover of every magazine ever since 9-10. No one ever heard of that brand. 9-12, not a person alive who had not ISIS comes along and expands the market to the West. Women are joining that group, Do you know? Yeah. These homicidal motherfuckers are fantastic marketers. Al-Qaeda's not a brand, Jonathan. It's a terrorist organization. Everything's a brand, Tom. I'm a brand, you're a brand, Dad's a brand, and a brand in trouble. Right. Everything is a brand. That's a clip from something called Happyish. You should see it if you haven't. It's, um, it's a slightly dark comedy about this advertising um, guy that's attempting to find happiness in the bottom of a Lexa Pro bottle. But, um, but the point they're making is that everything is a brand and everyone wants to be a brand or they should. Everyone but these guys. Um, that's not a notion that happens um, in banking. There's no conversation around the bank wanting to be a brand. Um, and that's, you know, kind of that's, that's, it has many reasons why that became so. But I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment to kind of give you a little bit of my background and of my journey so that you understand how I worked out that these guys don't want to be um, a brand. So going back in time a few, many, many fintech years ago, which is a few years ago in human years, um, I had started as one of the first employees with a company called Meniga, and they were doing something quite close to consumers' hearts. They were doing, um, they, were, they were writing a product called PFM, which is personal financial management, literally just looking at transactional data and making it smarter for the consumer. So because we were doing this, we were intrinsically doing a lot of thinking about what do the consumers really, really want and what can we do to make their lives any better. Um, and what we were doing with this product was sell it to banks so that they get smarter themselves and offer it to their consumers and their consumers love them and all that good stuff. Um, in, in the course of doing this, of selling this, I, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough, depending on your perspective, to sit down with maybe... 40, 50, 60 banks around the world in their boardrooms and, and figure out with them what they do know and what they want to do and what their digital strategy is and how much do they or don't they love their consumers. So that's how I, I got to find out all of this stuff. Now, I have a background in psychology and um, at the end of that, I reformed and I, I got an MBA as well, just to be sure. Um, so having started from that perspective, when I started in FinTech, I thought every bank um, somewhere in kind of its vaults in its uh, in somewhere five, six levels below where the safes are, would have a laboratory where they would be studying how people feel about their money. I was positive that existed, and I just don't know about it because I was coming from other um, industries. And, you know, that they would have these guys in white coats flashing a yen in front of your nose or showing you a dollar sign and figuring out how that makes you feel or saying the word bills and checking your blood pressure, any of those things. And um, as, as time went by, I was more and more surprised to see that there are no secret laboratories. Nobody does that and nobody um, kind of sits around to piece together what is it that makes us tick in terms of money um, and that to a degree banks don't really care. 
it is the same exact reason why they don't really care to become a brand, which is nobody has sat around to, um, to, to um, compact the importance of figuring out how people feel. And it, this became very puzzling to me. And as, as time went by and as, as I was going further and further in understanding banks and further and further from uh, understanding consumers, which is something we do in banking, um, I, I, you know, I couldn't quite comprehend why is it that we don't spend, we spend so much money in banking on so many silly things. Surely um, the amount of money it would cost us to figure out how people really feel can be wasted. Um, so, you know, I did, this makes you a little bit upset with bankers, but um, you, you can't just continuously blame them because bankers are humans as well. Um, and what, what, kind of, what kind of puzzled me is the, the relationship we have with money is the second most important relationship in our lives after love and family. Um, and and it's, it's very vital, it's very intrinsic to our identity, it's, it's all of these things. And we study the, what happens to tomatoes if you keep them under the moonlight for too long. Well, we don't study what happens when, when you need to kind of pay a bill for a, for a burial that you can't afford or things like that. So um, to give you an example of how deep this relationship is, um, in the UK, you're more likely to change spouses than you are to change banks. Um, in fact, the average relationship with a, a spouse is 11 years, and it's 17 years for a bank account. Um, that can't be in the UK only. Just earlier today, I was having a conversation with a gentleman from Canada who uh, confessed to having had the same bank account since he was 16, is it? Right, so that, that does happen. People stay put with their banks, and that's for a number of reasons. It's really fascinating. I think we should spend a lot more time and money figuring that out, because if we think that these guys have irrational loyalty, I would challenge that. I think Apple and Android and everyone else who we like to think about as a good brand that made um, intrinsic loyalty capital um, is quite rational in terms of having uh, that reaction from people. They give them a product at the end of the day, a product that they like, they can count on, and mean something to them. Banking, on the other hand, has made some products, none of which are things we asked for, but we had better use them in the way that they give them to us. Um, and, you know, I've been writing a series of blogs about this, and I'm not saying you should read them because they're probably too many and too boring, but they explore kind of what is it that keeps us with our bank. Um, it's easy to kind of just um, uh, get a couple of, of laughs in fintech these days just by saying, you know, it's a, it's a Stockholm syndrome. They abuse us left, right, and center. We should just leave. We should just switch. But, you know, we say all that, and yet we don't. So there must be much more there. A lot of it is about trust. A lot of it, a lot of it is about how banks have been there for really longer than most of our co-workers or our adult relationships, and they know things about us that those people don't know and we don't want them to know. Um, so a part of it is the fact that they're so interwoven in our lives, and you know, part of it is that we kind of like them, but none of it is that they represent us in any which way. None of it is because we feel connected to that brand. But there are some banks that have done quite well on their digital experience, and I've been fortunate enough to meet a bunch of them. Um, what they all have in common, and you know, there are examples out there in the industry. Um, CBA, for instance, to my mind, is a bank that did well. M-Bank is, without a doubt, maybe some of you in the room have heard about them, they're probably the digital standard um, these days. Um, there are a number of banks that are INGs did well, so those banks did okay by their consumers, we like using them, um, and they are kind of um, the, the golden standard. And what they all have in common, I think that's where it becomes interesting, is something I call an experienced superman. So you can always trace it back to this one dude who had a lot of courage, a lot of vision, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of courage. Let's leave it at that. Um, one of these guys, and I'll give you a story about them because it makes a lot of sense on what I'm saying, um, is Michal Panowicz, who is the... Um, guy behind M-Bank uh, in, in Poland. So he's the hero that went to Commerzbank and said, this is the amount of money I need, and this is the amazing vision I will put into practice, and he set about and did that in quite record time. So he's, he's a hero from everybody's point of view. Um, I'm fortunate enough that we are quite close, and about two or three years ago when I arrived at this concept of emotional banking, meaning banks should sit down and think about consumers' emotions. Um, I was really excited with it, and it was um, one evening after um, a Finnovate event. I don't know if 
people in this room have heard of Innovate. It's a, it's a really boring demo only two days event uh, in Europe or America. And at the end of it, where both my company and his company had won best of show that time, so we were out celebrating and and yes, having a drink or two. Um, the day after or, or such, I was about to fly to Australia to, um, to, to do a conference um, called Next Bank. Um, and, and as I was constructing the speech with my VP of uh, product management at the time, we, we realized that we don't, we don't have concepts such as happy money or sad money. Or what, I mean, there must be, there must be that. I mean, what is happy money? And what is, what makes kind of, what is money that riddles you with anxiety? What's sad money? And I mean, we were talking about all these things and that's how we arrived at the concept of, of emotional banking. So I was telling him the story about, you know, we, we constructed this speech, it's going to be amazing, it's going to be about people's feelings in banking. And he says, wow, absolutely, my team and I, that's all we talk about, that's how we built M-Bank, we really care about our consumers, so that's amazing, it's time we talk about this. Um, and he says, but one thing, is there, do you absolutely necessarily have to say feelings? So, well, you know, it is feelings, it's how, you know, kind of, it's how you, how you look at things, it's how you, you know, how you get connected to, to your consumers, it's their feelings, it's their emotions. He says, yeah, 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 no, no, I know that, I'm not saying it's not, but do you have to call it emotions? Can't you kind of call it their reactions? It isn't just their reactions, Michelle, it's re literally how they feel. Um, he says, no, 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 I get it. It's not that I disagree with you, it's just I'm, I'm wondering about the term. You're talking to a room filled with bankers, do you absolutely need to say feelings? Maybe we should say needs. Um, and this went on and on for hours of, of him just literally trying to find a better term. And, you know, I can't hold it against him, he was trying to help. And I, to be fair, I've heard that again today from someone I hold in very high respect, and I'm wondering if I might be wrong, I might need to stop using it. Um, because, realistically, I think it's called feelings. I don't know if this was Michelle the man who couldn't call it feelings, or it was Michelle the banker who couldn't call it, call it feelings, but something's wrong there. Um, and I'm not going to go into a long tirade about how the banking industry doesn't have women, but it doesn't. So it might be part of what happened there and why we can't really say the word feelings. But to be fair, we can't really say the word feelings in business in general. It's a bit of a shameful thing. Um, but, and or maybe it was a cultural issue, because at the end of the day, Michelle represents Commerzbank, and that's all I'm going to say in this conference about it. But I go on another two slides in conferences that are not in Germany. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> that's all I say everywhere else. Um, but essentially, we just need to find a way that we can actually say feelings and look into them. It's not really that difficult and we should have done. Now, um, there are some banks that have done this and done this right. This is an example. Their name is uh, Che Banca in Italy. Um, and they, if you see this corner, they won an award, um, which, you know, how many banks win awards, who cares? This one is really important because they won an award for being a super brand. So they were competing against the Nikes, the, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the apples, the, the Starbucks, and they still won. So the Italians like them better than they like their coffee. That's got to be much. Now, if we look at some of the things they're doing, I'll just play you a really short thing, which um, might be a bit loud, so apologies. Right? Exactly. How many more people have one of those with, from their bank? Um, and more importantly, and I play this video in, um, in, in my workshops that I do with banks sometimes um, around whether it's more important to have EX, which is emotional experience, or UX, which we all know what it is. Um, and after I play it, I ask them how it made them feel. And a mere 10, 15 minutes later, they start answering me, this is a bank. Um, and so, well, the way it makes them feel normally, eventually we, we end up figuring it out, that it's joyful, it's hopeful, it's fun, it's, um, it gives them that type of impression. And more importantly, whatever that ad made you feel, that's how you keep feeling being the, um, the customer of Kebanka while you do so in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Italy. And that's what keeps people hearts and that's what keeps people 
uh, believing they are the awesomest brand ever. And they are, believe it or not, the only bank I know who set out with the idea of becoming a brand and not only that of selling us a savings product. Um, and I'll be really, I'm actually ahead of time, which is really uh, shocking for me normally. I have two more things to show you. One of them is um, an, a little clip from a movie that I think almost everyone in this room would have seen is Ex Machina. And it's, uh, you'll have to forgive, I'm not a, I'm not a great pirater. Is that a, a word? No. So I, I was not very good at capturing this video. So, which means that there's a lot of clicks in the background. But what I'd like you to listen for, if you can, uh, unless this is really bad, is a little sound that um, Ava, the machine, makes. Um, you'll see that she makes uh, a couple of sounds as she moves, hopefully. Let's see. Well. You get the picture. She makes a little sound. It's not a lot of it, but she makes an electronic sound as she moves, and then she makes another electronic sound as she cocks her head. And I've seen a couple of interviews with the makers of this, and there is a reason behind why they've done this. They've decided while they were looking um, at, the, at, at the footage they had in post-production that Ava looks too human. The actress is too pretty, people are not necessarily going to believe that she's a machine. So they've added this sound so that the viewer is reminded she's a machine after all. And I dearly wish that there was a sound in banking that would play in a banker's head in the background every time they look at the consumer to remind them they're human after all. That's all I had. Thank you so much. <laughs>